Thank you, God, for this time together today. Thank you, Jesus, that today as we come together to reflect on your resurrection and we gather wherever we're watching today, Lord Jesus, through whatever device, wherever we're sitting in the world today, Father, we place ourselves in your presence and we put our eyes on your work and we receive the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ for us today. I thank you, Jesus, that every person watching has an encounter with your grace and leaves changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, church, welcome today for literally the best Sunday of our year, Resurrection Sunday. This is, for me, literally my favorite sermon because I get to talk about what Jesus came to do and what that means for you. And today, I really believe God wants to touch you with His love, to surround you with His grace, and to give you a fresh encounter with the person of Christ, with His work, allowing you to live in the victory that the resurrection purchased for us. So often around Easter, we emphasize the cross of Jesus Christ, but sometimes we overlook the power of the resurrection. See, the cross of Jesus Christ paid for the price of our sin when he became the sacrifice, literally the living sacrifice, to secure for us a right standing with God, perfect and pleasing, paying the price to deal with our sickness, to deal with our sin, giving up his body, giving up his blood for us. Literally, it's an unbelievable thing to recognize what Jesus did at the cross. But never forget, not only did he die for us and pay for our sin and purchase for us the righteousness of heaven, but he rose from the dead, conquering death as a receipt, as proof that what happened at the cross was more than enough and his resurrection is our eternal guarantee of our righteousness and eternal salvation. Not only are we destined for eternity as perfect, pleasing children of God in the presence of God without shame, but we actually are able to live from that power here on earth today. What I wanna do is bring you into the moment, bring you based on scripture into the atmosphere of that Resurrection Sunday. The record of what God did, and I wanna emphasize three things to you today. Today's sermon, the title of my sermon today, what I want you to highlight, and if you're sitting next to someone, you can tap them and you can say this or you can write it down. I want you to, to look at each other. I want you to look at the screen and I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, the people, the places, and the purpose. Turn, in, in church we joke and say, turn to your other favorite person because you would have turned to someone or if you didn't have anyone there, hey, you can just repeat this again, turn to someone else, turn to someone that's not there. But I want you to say it again. I want you to say, the people, the places, and the purpose. The so scripture records for us those three things in great detail. The people, the places, and the purpose of the resurrection of Christ. See, we often think Jesus in his resurrected form. I even think we would think in a religious mindset, God after conquering the grave and going through the cross would want to go to the people we would think have it all together that he would want to go to the places that have the absolute highest levels of faith and that the purpose of it would be to release a higher level of living of the people already living at a higher level. In other words, to release the good people into greatness, to release the, the people who were already doing a good job into betterness and, and giving the stronger even more might. But actually, I can't wait to show you today, Jesus does the exact opposite. Now, God is a God of order, a God of pattern, and a God of priority. So when God goes and does something for the first time, he's trying to highlight something to us. When God appears to a people for the first time, when God performs a miracle for the first time, when scripture is written for the first time, the first time something happens in scripture, God is highlighting something. 
And you might think today, you're watching and you might say, Pastor, truth is today, I'm watching this sermon and I'm barely even hanging on. I'm barely even, I'm barely even listening. I'm going through so much stuff. I'm just tolerating what you're saying because I, I don't recognize myself as being in a place of strong faith, myself as being in a place of, of goodness and, and I've got hope. Uh, maybe you look at yourself today and you say, you have no idea the mess of my past. You have no idea what I've done in my past and where I'm at right now. Or, or maybe you just say, the truth is you don't understand how oppressed I am, how much I am just weighed down by what's going on inside of me. Or maybe you're even saying, actually, today, I, you don't even know, I've been diagnosed with deep depression. Maybe you're sitting and you're saying, I'm, I'm literally having suicidal thoughts and I am as depressed as you could get. There's no hope. I'm just giving this five minutes of my time and see what happens. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, well, I doubt Jesus. Why would he care about me? I don't even know if I believe. I don't even know what I know, what I can tell you is I'm disappointed. What I can tell you is I'm cynical. What I can tell you is given what I've seen about religion and Christianity recently, I don't even know if I believe in this God. I certainly don't believe in his so-called people. Now, I've been so let down by people that say they know Jesus, or I've been so hurt. Maybe you've even been abused by someone who has a so-called relationship with Jesus. Maybe you've been misused by people in positions of authority in a religious environment. And you sit here today and you say, huh, let me tell you something. I I I'm a doubter. I'm a cynic. I don't even know what I believe. Maybe you started out 2020 full of faith and you were like, huh, I'm all in. I think church is the greatest thing in the world. I think God is awesome. I'm on such a high spiritually. I have scriptures on my bumper stickers on my car. I have scriptures on my mug and my coffee cup. I have scriptures on my t-shirts. I know them off by heart. I have them printed out and on my mirror. And maybe, maybe you're sitting here today and you say, what started out as faith has become completely about fear. Maybe you literally were on an absolute high at the beginning of 2020, but through COVID, your faith has gone to nothing. Maybe you're watching social media and the news and literally what overwhelms you all the time is fear. And people say to you, have faith, have faith, have faith. And you're like, you don't understand. I'm literally just in fear. I, I don't even know how I'm even gonna get back to believing again. You can relate to any of those people today. In fact, maybe all of them. Maybe there's an element that describes where you're at right now. And you say, you know what? I don't even know what to believe anymore. Let's hear what this Resurrection Sunday, this traditional Easter Sunday thing's all about. Well, I have good news for you because you're in the right place and God's gonna say something to you that's gonna bless you today and make you realize Jesus rose from the dead for you. And in fact, if today was Resurrection Sunday, you might get a surprise. So let's go to the story. John chapter 20, verses one tells us now on the first day of the week, now in the Jewish calendar, that is not a Monday, that's a Sunday. So on a Sunday, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. Now I need to pause and say, Mary Magdalene is a very interesting person from scripture. We know that she is a well-documented person with an interesting relationship to Jesus. She is known as a lady who was deeply troubled, so much so that people believed she was demon-possessed. She would manifest. Now, I'm not just talking about, when someone has a possession, it's believed that she has evil possession. It is not because she just has a bad day. It's because she is unable to function in society. She scares people. She's uncontrollable. Things that go on when someone is possessed, it just looks like someone who's at the breaking point or has broken. And the Bible says that she was demon possessed and she was a great trouble. There's different beliefs on her past. Some people believe that she was um, a prostitute, but that's not really been guaranteed. But the reality of the situation is she was known for having a dysfunctional life in the society in which she lived. Not just social media, but literally living face-to-face -face with people. 
People in her environment just went, she's bad news. She's a mess. She's beyond help. And even the religious leaders of the day had given up. There was no helping Mary Magdalene. Yet when Jesus came along, he literally ministered to her in such a degree that it was documented as if immediately there was a change in her. And they say she was demon-possessed, and why they would liken it is because her spirit, her person, and her entire demeanor changed forever in an instant. She went from someone who was deeply troubled and unable to function within a society to someone who literally went on known as one of the most famous followers of Jesus, one of the most well-documented miracle marvels of a living person who was a certain way, bound and broken, and yet after an encounter with Jesus was completely the opposite. So Mary Magdalene goes down to the tomb early. Why? Because the encounter she had with Jesus had such a profound effect on her life that when he was killed, when he was crucified, she couldn't help herself but be broken to the core. And in the custom of the day, her sole desire was to go and mourn and take care of the dead. When you love someone who dies, you mourn their death. And in the culture of the day, you would go down to the tomb as a part of your mourning process. And she went down when it was still dark because it was not actually appropriate for her to be there. So the Bible records that it, we would never have known that she went to the tomb. And in fact, you don't even know if she went to the tomb the day before as well. And that she was going to the tomb on a regular basis in the dark because she did not want people to see her there. It was not appropriate that she was there. See, even though she had changed on the inside, her status in society still had her mocked. And even as a woman, she shouldn't have been there. But she wasn't even a woman of stature and status. She was someone who was mocked as a problem child, as a person who was of disrepute and disregard. In John chapter 20, verses 1, we see that she arrives early and we see that she recognizes that the tomb is sitting with the door wide open. In fact, in that day and age, it was such a controversial death that Jesus went through that the leaders of the day said they knew that Jesus had spoken about a possible resurrection and there's a lot of prophecy and description of the Messiah being raised from the dead. And so around this Jesus character saying he was going to be God, they didn't want the problem of having him disappear and then having the followers say he was raised from the dead. So in fact, the Romans ordered the security on his tomb and they closed his tomb in with a huge stone. It's believed that it weighed tons, not a few hundred kilograms, but tons. And that that stone was placed with guards in front so that no one who followed Jesus could come in and steal the body and say he rose from the dead. That would have been what they least wanted, was more controversy around this so-called self-proclaimed Messiah. Yet she goes down to the tomb and she doesn't see security guards, she doesn't see Roman guards, and she notices that this huge stone that weighed tons has been rolled away and that the tomb is sitting wide open. And so if we go there, let's read together. It then says in verse 2, then she ran and came to Simon Peter. Because now that she sees the tomb is open, right, she's panicked. We'll see later in this chapter, she actually believed Jesus' body was stolen. So she comes to Simon Peter. Now, let's pause for a moment. The second name mentioned in John is Simon Peter. Simon Peter is Peter, the disciple who denied Jesus. So <laughs> Mary doesn't run to a well-known religious person with a great standing. She goes to Simon Peter because <laughs> next to her, he's the one with the least reputable reputation at the time. He is the one who denied Christ. And according to Scripture, denial is a greater sin than betrayal. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, was still in a better standing than Peter, who denied Christ. Peter is the most out of the picture. Peter is the most rejected. Peter is the most 
literally the, the poster child of how to fail your leader was Peter. So Mary runs to Simon Peter, and then we see John introduces himself, because it's his gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So she comes to Simon Peter and John and says, they've taken Jesus out of the tomb. We don't know where they've laid him. In other words, he's been stolen. So Peter goes running and John, and they arrive at the tomb. They both run together. And in verse four, we notice that John ran faster than Peter. I, 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 I relate to Peter on so many levels in life, and that's another one. I am the worst runner you will ever find, and I'm proud of it. Anyways, well, I'm glad I can't run because it's my excuse that I'd never have to run. And if you're a great runner, I envy you in any case, right? And what happens? <laughs> I'm just messing around. Okay, in verse five, stooping down, looking in, what happens? They see that the linen cloths are lying there. So John sees that the clothes... In other words, the linen that wrapped Jesus, when you die in a Jewish custom at the time of the day, they would wrap you in a linen burial outfit. And it was like a cloth, almost like a big wrapping, okay? And it was part of the process of embalming the body. And so John notices from the outside as he stoops down and he looks into the tomb that the cloths that would have been around Jesus' body are lying there. So Peter comes in verse 6, following him, and goes into the tomb, and he sees the clothes are lying there, the cloths. But he also notices, it says there, the handkerchief that was around Jesus' head was there, but it was highlighted by God. It was folded in a place by itself. So not only does God just unwrap Jesus' body, but Peter knows, notices that the head handkerchief, the head wrapping, was folded and neatly placed, okay? And I, I love that. We're going to pause there for a moment because that head handkerchief is called a sudarian and it literally means head sweat cloth and it was designed to soak up all the sweat that came out of the body at death and post-death. It was there to capture all the stress and the pain. And what's so interesting is we know that when Jesus took our cup, right, one of the first things Curses pronounced on Adam was that by the sweat of your brow will you eat of the field, of the ground. You will toil, and by your sweat will you eat bread. And we know that the first thing that Jesus does with his blood is he sweats blood from his head in the Garden of Gethsemane when he takes our cup for us. Why? Because he was removing the curse pronounced on Adam and Eve that we know the blood of the sacrificial lamb removes the curse only by blood. And not only did Jesus highlight that in the statement and in the act of sweating blood for us, but the very handkerchief that was used to soak up that blood when he died at the cross and bury him was not just left in the corner in a pile. It was neatly highlighted and left in the tomb. Why was it left in the tomb? Well, what's interesting is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he said, Lazarus came, come forth. And we know from scripture, Lazarus comes out of the tomb still covered in his burial clothes. And Jesus's words were, loose him, let him go. Death was still around him and he had to be loosed of the death and the consequence of death. Why? Because Christ had yet to die in our place. But when Jesus died for us and was raised from the dead, every single linen cloth remained in the tomb where it was meant to be. It was never a part of the resurrected Christ's outfit, anything. And what I love is Jesus even highlights the head sweat cloth. By the sweat of your brow will you no longer need to work. And what even reinforces this, which I love, is in verse 12, right? When Mary looks inside the tomb, she sees two angels sitting, right? One at the head and one at the feet where Jesus would have lain. Now, that's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant because we know in the Ark of the Covenant where the mercy seat is, where the blood of the lamb had to be sprinkled. There are two cherubim angels standing God facing over it, right? But that was the Ark of the Covenant, right? However, when Jesus 
does the finished work of the Ark of the Covenant, something's different. At the head and the feet, on either side of surrounding the blood and the sacrifice, on the mercy seat, on the top of the Ark, what are the angels doing? They're seated. First time in Scripture, seated angels is mentioned is when Christ has risen. Because now it's not about the work of the angels. It's about the work of our raised high priest. It is reinforced. It's now his work, not our work. It is now about our risen Christ, not us. But what I love is the whole time through this passage of Scripture, God is reinforcing something to us. We're even going to keep going on. And what's so awesome is literally Mary hasn't seen what's actually happened yet, even though she's spoken to the angels. And they say, why are you weeping in verse 13? And she says, because they've stolen Jesus. She still doesn't realize he's been raised from the dead. It even tells us in the scripture a bit earlier that they had yet to know the scripture says it's necessary that Christ is raised from the dead. Okay? So even as we're reading here together, she complains and she says, yeah, but I don't know. That's why I'm weeping. I don't know where Jesus is. And she turns in verse 14, she turns around and Jesus is actually there. And he says to her in verse 15, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? And she still thinks she's talking literally to a gardener, uh, you know, because the tombs have beautiful gardens around. So she's not just talking to someone who's there to take care of the garden before the crowds arrived when the sun comes up. And she says, where is Jesus? Where did you put him? right? Hmm. Where did you take him? And he says in verse 16, he says, Mary. And she realizes it's Jesus. And she says, Rabbi. And she wants to throw herself on him. And he says, don't grab upon me yet. Don't cling to me. I have yet to be ascended into heaven. And he says, I'm going to be ascending to my father, but not yet. But go and tell everybody. Go and tell everybody I have been raised from the dead. And she runs to tell the disciples all the things Jesus told her. That same evening, right? It's interesting because now we want to talk about one other place Jesus shows up to another group of people. In Luke chapter 24, verses 14, it tells us chronologically that prior to Jesus showing up to the group of the disciples, so once he shows himself to Mary, he goes somewhere else. Do you know where he goes? He goes to a couple who are literally on a place called the road to Emmaus. And if we read in verse 14 all the way through to verse 35, I'll summarize it for the sake of time today. Jesus says to them, why are you so sad? And do you know the Greek word there as he appears to this couple is he says, why are you sad? The Greek word there is why are you depressed? Why are you so depressed? And they go on telling Jesus who conceals his identity from them. So they don't know it's him. And they tell him how, don't you know? This Jesus of Nazareth that our hope was in, he's dead. He's dead. And there's rumors that he's raised from the dead, but in fact, we don't even know if it's true. And we thought he came to save us, but he hasn't. And yet Jesus opens the Bible and he starts to reveal all the things concerning himself in verse 17. And what's so interesting is as this exchange starts to happen, he starts to show them from scripture it was necessary that he, that Christ would come and that Christ would die and that Christ would be the picture of everything we saw from Genesis all the way through to Joshua, all the way through all the pictures, all the typologies ending up in the revelation that actually Christ was Messiah and that he fulfilled prophecy. And it tells us later in the chapter that literally as they sit down and they break bread, their eyes are open and we know what breaking bread is. Today we're going to do it together. They receive communion and they see who Jesus is as the broken body the bread, the body offered for us, the sacrificial lamb, and they see the blood and it tells us that their eyes are opened and they believe. And it tells us Jesus leaves. And then they stand up, they look at each other and they say, didn't our hearts burn as we heard him reveal himself from scripture? And as they reflect on the fact that he's the risen Christ, they stand up and they run back in at the late, late, late at night, back into Jerusalem to testify to everyone, Christ has been raised from the dead. The Messiah is alive, right? They receive communion. So Jesus first appears to Mary, and then he appears on the road to Emmaus. 
Mary being a person of what? Ill repute, brokenness, an incredible path of bondage. Then we see how Peter has literally, as the disciple who failed Jesus the most, he gets to see the angels, the head sweat cloth. He starts to realize what has happened. And now Jesus appears to two people who by the Greek definition of the word are plagued with depression. (laughs) And where else does Jesus go? He goes to a gathering. Now we're going to go straight back into John again, John chapter 20, verses 19, and I want to show you now who Jesus appears to. Now what's interesting is the disciples were gathered at this time on this Sunday. They were gathered, but they weren't gathered the way you think they were gathered. You might think that the disciples who saw Jesus walk on water, who saw Jesus raise people from the dead, who saw Jesus multiply food from enough for one boy to enough to feed 20,000, that they would be gathered talking about their mission, talking about their mandate. In other words, we're the disciples. We've been, we, we're ready to go and to teach and to, to tell and to be a representation of our Lord and, and to tell the teachings of our rabbi. You'd think they'd be gathered in faith on a Sunday, especially Resurrection Sunday. I mean, they not only witnessed Jesus dying on the cross, but they would have witnessed that darkness came over Jerusalem and an earthquake hit at the moment Jesus died to such a degree that we know that the veil of the Holy of Holies in the temple tore from top to bottom like a like a piece of paper. Impossible. You know that the veil was made to be impenetrable because we knew that the ark of the, of the covenant of God rested in the Holy of Holies. And if anyone in an ungodly way was exposed to it, they died. So they would knit the veil to be so thick and they would test it by having four or five horses on this side, four or five horses on that side tied to the veil and the testing of the veil because they'd have one up and then they'd be testing the one that would replace it For maintenance purposes, literally they made sure that the veil was never penetrable. You could never get through it naturally. The one that they were testing for replacing, they would have horses run in opposite directions just to test the strength of it. They witnessed that that veil tore from top to bottom. All the declarations that this was the Messiah, wouldn't they be gathered in faith on Resurrection Sunday? No. Let's see what the Bible says. The same day at evening began on the first day of the week when the doors were shut and the disciples were assembled in fear of the Jews. They weren't there praying for a revival. They weren't there talking about what God's going to do through them. They were there talking about how we get out of being a disciple because we're going to get killed. How do we avoid what's happened to Jesus happening to us? And how do we quickly disassociate ourselves from this mess? Maybe you're sitting there today and you say, you know, I'm nothing but a person of faith. I'm just a person of fear. Welcome to the club. And what's so interesting is in that moment, assembled in fear, Jesus appears. And what would you do if you were the resurrected Christ? You'd just been through the cross for these people who knew why you were going, why you were dying, that you were going to be raised from the dead. I would appear to them and correct them and condemn them, wouldn't you? No, no, no. That's not what the grace of Jesus is all about. That's what he paid for at the cross. All of our flesh, all of our failures, all of our humanity, all of our brokenness. And he shows up and you know what he says? He stands in the midst. He stands right in the middle of their fear. You know, often we tell people, you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Have guts, have courage. You know what? It's awesome to have those things, but they are a fruit of seeing more of Jesus. You cannot have them in your own strength. If the disciples could not gather in faith, no one could. And they gathered in fear and Jesus goes right into the first gathering is a gathering of fear that he shows up in, not a gathering of faith. God shows up himself resurrected in the midst of fear and he says, peace be with you. And how does he introduce peace? He shows his hands and his wounds. In other words, he shows, I've paid the price for you. Have peace. Knowing that all the fear, all the brokenness, all the mess, that's what I died for. I'm not just raised from the dead as a reigning king. I'm the king who carries your scars to remind you for eternity. You know, Jesus has those scars in heaven showing all proof for eternity. We have been paid for in full by his work. 
It's an eternal work. And he shows them and he says, peace be unto you. And that's not just peace like, hey, everything's okay. It's shalom, be whole. Everything's okay. The Father has sent me and I'm also gonna send you. Then he breathes upon them to receive the Holy Spirit. What I love about this is you would think, okay, that's awesome. But look at this, right? It tells us in scripture, in verse 24, someone was missing, Thomas, the twin of one of the 12 who was with them when Jesus came. And the disciples told him about this event. And they said, don't you know, we have seen the risen Jesus. And he says, unless I see his hands and the actual nail scars and the actual wounds, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe in a ghost. I need to know this is the actual Jesus I saw crucified. He's known as Doubting Thomas. (laughs) You know what we believe often around religion? The moment you doubt, God judges you. The moment you walk in cynicism, God wants nothing to do with you. Maybe you're watching today and you say, yo, I thought I was always destined for hell because I've always told God I doubt whether he even exists. I don't even know if this really happens. Can I show you from scripture the character of God? It tells us eight days, verse 26, eight days the disciples were gathered again and this time Thomas was with them. Now we know he's heard the testimony of the resurrected Christ from the disciples, his friends and family, yet he still doesn't believe. So he's gathered with them and Jesus chooses to show up again. The doors are closed and Christ as a ghost in a way comes through because they're they're highlighting that everything's closed, but he shows up. How did he get in here, right? And you would think Jesus would say, yeah, hey everybody, good to see you all. Thomas, you're going to hell. Come on now. No, but look at this. Jesus comes back in and he says, peace, peace to you. And you know what? He, as God, heard Thomas saying, because God knows what you say. He's God. He hears it all. Jesus didn't appear to the disciples to give them faith or peace. He came specifically for Thomas. And you know what Jesus says? Because I can imagine Thomas was standing there like, uh, 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 because he'd been telling everyone, you know, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. And look at what Jesus says. He says to Thomas, hey, come. Reach your finger, look at my hands, touch, right? See, I don't want you to be an unbeliever. I came today so that you could believe. I love it because Jesus shows up to the oppressed, the possessed, the deniers. <laughs> Even Jesus calls by calls for Peter in the book of Mark. He actually says to Mary, go tell the disciples to meet me. And Peter, he he singles out in his resurrected state every failure as literally on his list of I've got to go and bring redemption in their life. And even to Thomas, he says, I'm here so that you don't remain in unbelief. The more we wrestle with life, the more Christ is drawn into our situation. He is so near not to judge you because he's paid for your judgment. He so desires that he'll do whatever he can so that you can shift from unbelief to belief so that he can come into your life and do the work he wants to do. All the people, Christ, the resurrected Christ, on the very first day he's raised from the dead that he is documented to appear to, we're all the unqualified. You have the demon possessed of ill repute, You have the deniers. You have those gathered in faith. You have those literally covered with depression and oppression and disappointment on the road to Emmaus. You even have the doubter recorded. The Bible tells us in John, it's so awesome, because Thomas obviously answers and believes, and God says, you know, you're blessed that after this process you believe, but let me tell you something. There are, going to be people, there are going to be people so blessed because they wouldn't have seen me in person, but they're still going to believe. That's you and I, right? Greater blessings. And it goes on in verse 30 to tell us, which I love, I want to encourage you today. Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, many other miracles. That's in verse 30. 
and they're not written in this book. So Jesus could have done the most incredible miracles that were in the presence of the disciples after his resurrection, yet they were not recorded because the Holy Spirit went to the effort to record the greatest miracles. God wants to highlight that Jesus came for the possessed, the oppressed, the depressed, the doubter, the cynic, the unbeliever, the unqualified, the denier. That's what's recorded. That's what he wants you to know. That's what he wants to highlight. That's what the resurrection was all about. Why? It says in verse 31, these things are written that you may believe. I don't know where you're watching from today. <laughs> Do you feel unqualified? Do you feel like you're living out of fear? That your faith has left the building? <laughs> that you're depressed, oppressed? Maybe you feel today like, I'm still even a doubter and a cynic. God captured these in specific detail, in chronological order, so that you would believe, according to Scripture, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing, you would have supernatural life in His name. The resurrection is all about highlighting how the unqualified, how the unbelieving, how those whose natural ability isn't impressive, who, whose natural CV and resume doesn't impress anybody out there, but by believing that Jesus Christ died and rose again for them, they would walk in the life that he gives them. The Bible tells us that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead can live in us. So often I think, we think, Jesus functioning through us is about us first earning it, first making a, 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 you know, a impressive performance. No, no, no. The very character of God as documented here in Scripture today for you to know on Resurrection Sunday is that if you are in any of those categories of those people, if you're in any of those places, place of fear, a place of doubt, a place of, of unbelief, a place of discouragement. You have to recognize the purpose of the risen Christ was to show up in this situation to you today so that you could have an encounter with his love and grace and walk in a supernatural life by believing in him and leaning on the name of Jesus. Fear, depression, and oppression, it's part of this natural life. It's part of what it is that's going on in our world right now. But Jesus would come right into our midst and declare peace and declare, look, I've paid the price. I'm right here with you. I'm right here walking with you. I love the gentleness of our Jesus and how he even allows people to elaborate on their frustrations, on the road to Emmaus, to elaborate on how they're disappointed. You know, God's never gonna cut you off. Shut up, stop saying that. Stop, stop operating in unbelief. He lets you talk. He lets you talk yourself out until you literally go, I've got nothing else to say, God, except I don't know what to do. Okay, my child, that's why I'm here. Peace. Look at the gentleness Jesus treats Thomas with. Come, Thomas, come close. I heard you complaining all week about how unless you can touch me, you're not going to believe. That's okay. That's why I'm here. Come close so that you can believe. His gentleness today, he draws near. And whatever it is, whatever you're facing, however you feel, Jesus paid the price and he rose from the dead so that he could change your life. I love how he shows up to individuals and he shows up to small rooms. And come on now, wouldn't you, if you were the resurrected Christ, show up on a hill and gather a million people and give an instruction? He goes to the individual who's suffering, who's weeping. Mary's weeping 
he shows up, Mary, don't cry. It's me. He's so gentle. He's so loving. And he so cares for you to know him as Lord and Savior. If you're watching right now, I'm going to pray for two categories of people. Firstly, I want to pray over people that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you're watching this and you don't know what you believe, you don't know where you stand, I'm not asking you about your religious commitments and how long have you been in church or never been to church, how much of the Bible you know. I'm just asking you, have you ever looked to Jesus and said, with your lips and with your heart, I need you to save me. I believe you died for me and you rose again from the dead for me. The Bible says the moment you make that declaration with your mouth and believe it with your heart, Jesus comes into your life and changes you forever. And I've experienced that. And I truly believe it's the greatest day you can ever experience in your life. That greatest moment is when Christ's love and grace wraps its arms around you and saves you. So if you're watching right now and you've never prayed that prayer before, I wanna pray together with you. And then after that, we're gonna pray for people that Jesus wants to love and just wrap his arms around and encourage today who have sitting in discouragement and despair. So if you never prayed to receive Jesus right now, let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me by your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. You paid for all my sin and sickness. And I believe that you rose again from the dead so that I can be saved, so that I can live forever as a righteous, perfect child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, right now at the bottom of the screen, we're gonna put up some information. We would love to hear from you. Even if you're watching on social media, just throw up a hand or just say, I just prayed that prayer. Our team would love to just encourage you. We wanna send you some free gifts just from us to you to tell you more about Jesus. But this is the greatest moment ever. And we cannot wait to hear how God changes your life and walks with you through this. Right now, we're gonna to pray together. For people watching right now, maybe you identify with any of those people I listed today. Maybe we identify with all of them. We're just gonna pray for you because Jesus' ministry draws near and he breathes supernatural life into you. And you know what that feels like? Shalom, peace and wholeness. Father, I thank you for people watching today. Father, I thank you that you touch them, that you love them, that you whisper in their ears, that you're proud of them, that there's no failure so great that it overwhelms the work of the cross, that you have come for their redemption, that you see them perfect and pleasing and that you have a plan for their lives, Father, that even the people documented here in Scripture who show up literally at the Resurrection Sunday as failures, as disappointments, as people dealing with depression, oppression and fear, as they encounter the risen Christ, He speaks peace. He speaks love. He shows up in the midst of our mess, in the midst of our complaining, in the midst of our denial to bring peace, to bring wholeness. Father, I pray that peace is ours by the work of Jesus in Jesus' name. And right now we're gonna receive communion together. You know what this is? This is part of looking at the wounds of Jesus. This is as if you are touching his body, knowing that he paid the price for you, knowing that he suffered for you, knowing that he went through great agony for your healing and your wholeness today. So just take out your communion elements, your bread and your juice, water, whatever it is, crackers, whatever it is, that you have to represent the body of Jesus, the blood of Jesus today. Father, I thank you, Lord God. And as we do this, Father, we place our faith in you, Father. And we, we receive that you went through such a great suffering for us, Father. And I thank you, Lord God, that as your body was broken for us, our broken bodies, our broken, our broken, our brokenness, our sickness, our whatever it is that we're challenged with in our natural bodies today, Lord Jesus, we place on the cross. 
and we receive that you went through the greatest suffering for us. As we break this bread, we receive and we eat healing and wholeness unto our bodies in Jesus' name. We bless it. We receive it. You can eat. And Father, we thank you for healing and wholeness in everybody that eats today in every home. And if you can just take your juice, the blood of Jesus washes us clean of every failure, every mistake, past, present, and future. Redemption is our portion because of his blood. Perfection is our portion because of his blood. Father, I thank you that we are reminded how loved and cherished and precious we are to you today. And that by receiving your blood, we, we are reminded of how much you love us, our righteousness in you. Thank you, Jesus. We receive today. Amen. 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 Before we go, we always give people who are part of church the opportunity to worship God with their giving. And so as we do that, we know we trust fully in His work. So many people out there are fearing financial times because the times financially are the toughest we can even remember right now. But God wants you to have shalom. Shalom is nothing missing, nothing broken. The whole purpose of us trusting Him with our tithe is to walk in peace over our finances. We don't give out of fear. We give in faith. We don't give out of manipulation, but revelation. So those of you, as we give today, we worship Jesus. And I thank you, Father, for peace, wholeness, and provision supernaturally in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we give you the opportunity to worship with your giving, we're going to worship together. Thank you so much for being with us on this Resurrection Sunday. It's a huge blessing, and I pray that you are ministered to today. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place.